So, Marcus, it's been, what, two and a half decades? It has been, uh, what, almost 30 years? Yeah. Wow. You left New York when? The end of 1990. Oh, really? That long? And I you? Thought, I, I thought uh, I left Oregon in 1992 in terms of going to India back and forth, but I kept, I didn't actually leave until early 2000. But I thought you left like in the late 80s. No, I was still there. Still there. So, but looking at your pictures today, mm -hmm. I saw you were in India when you were a teenager, right? I went when I was 21. My parents sent me like around the world sort of to travel for like a year. Really? Before school. I mean, it, they didn't know it was going to be around the world. They thought I was just going to, to Greek islands, but... <laughs> <laughs> How did that happen? Well, I took an Olympic airline flight to, to, to uh, Greece, and then when it got... I spent the summer there, and then when the weather got really cold, I went back to um, Athens, and then they had a Greek Papadopoulos super, uh, civil war that went on broken. And there was tanks on the street and rubber bullets and we were being tear gassed out of our hotel and they closed all the borders and the only wow. border they opened was to Turkey, Istanbul. So I got on the first plane under this hangar with police, police and soldiers <laughs> and whatnot and got carted off to Istanbul, Turkey. And when I was there I was thinking, what am I going to do now? So I ran into um, a whole van full of Dutch hippies that were going overland to India. And they said, well, why don't you come with us? We need an extra hippie. <laughs> overland to and, India. Um, and I thought, and I said, well, I only had $1,000. And that's 1972. He said, $1,000? Like, you can live in India for a year on that. Wow. How and, long did that take to uh, so get there? Three weeks. <laughs> three weeks traveling through Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and into India. At a time where the, before, you know, war zones. Yeah, you know, there was no the, Afghanistan had, was not ravaged by by any of the Taliban or even before that by the Russians. It was a beautiful place. Wow! So I was lucky enough to go through the Persian deserts. I was even in Tehran, India, but in Tehran, uh, Iran, I stayed for a few weeks as my passport ran. So I, had to re, I had to reissue my, so I had a Canadian passport reissued in Tehran for five years. Wow. That wasn't too easy. Um, was that hard to get? It was easy to get then, but five, but later on it wasn't a great passport to have, so I had to lose it <laughs> <laughs> and get, get it renewed in a country that most right, people gonna... didn't feel was threatening. But at that time, the Shah of Iran was on the throne, you know, the Peacock throne, with his wife Farah, and it was kind of like a cross between. It was very Parisian, actually. I mean, the women were running around in mini skirts, and the women was very like you know, studio. Really? Floor kind of, yeah. yeah. I mean, Tehran was very hip before in the seventies. Wow, you thought you're a rare person to have seen it. Yeah, lucky. And God. it wasn't anything like the Tehran of today. Very fashionable. In fact, I was like the dirty little hippie. Everyone else was very chic. I saw that picture with the long curly hair. It was too sweet. Almost unrecognized. No, no, I can recognize easy. It's not unrecognizable. Mm -hmm. Even the baby pictures are easy to see. It oh, those are more, 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 yeah, I know. I didn't grow a nose or anything. I thought it would stay the same. Yeah. So India came into your life like at 21? Yeah, I first... Um, How about the camera? When did you start picking up a camera? Uh, well, you saw the picture. You have a photograph. Yeah, that's my true. My first plastic camera, I got it at a gas station for so, my father buying so much free gas. That's how I got my first camera. And you were how me. old? Hmm? How old were you at that time? Ten. Ten. Wow. Ten years old. So then what happened was that I came back and I went to college and I went to school. And I Studying I what? Photography. I have, uh -huh. a, I have a degree in photography. I have a bachelor's in photographic in San Francisco Institute. But bef and this is where I was traveling beforehand. So consequently, what left, uh, what left me with, um, I'm losing my train of thought here. Going to school, brownie, 10 years old. Ten you had a different camera by then. Moving up, right. So, what, so I went back and got lost in being an adult, growing up and being an adult, and then going to New York and having a so-called career. And, this and then I kind of forgot about India. Ah. So I got, as you know, involved in this 
sort of like a celebrity photographer or dealing with the arts and dancers and creative people and that was my life until um, I kind of got bored with New York and what made you bored with it? I mean, I know I got tired of it. <laughs> you want to turn the camera around? <laughs> I got bored with New York because, well, first of all, the world didn't need another picture of Madonna or Jodie Foster. I didn't feel like it. My work was, it was kind of getting superficial. And mm -hmm. I was getting more, I was tired of living in cities and the superficiality and the, the stress of everything costing twice as much as it should be. And um, I thought, I would take another trip back to India, so I did as a tourist. Oh, because I remember when I was still there, like in the late 80s, you were thinking of buying a place in India, weren't you? Yeah. No, uh, did I you? I was actually early 90s. Yeah? It must have been, yeah, it was in the 90s. I remember I had a picture of you having, a, I, in the studio having dinner. It's a picture of you and Patrick McMullen and Chad. Yeah. Right, I, yeah, I know. I think I sent you that. You next did, day. that was great. Yeah, I, so I decided that I wanted to go back, but I wanted to go back not as a tourist, clicking a camera, but bring a studio to do the same thing I did in New York, but do it in India. And so that started in 1993, which is where some of these photographs are that old. Like this one is one of the first photographs right here. The one that's the invitation. Yeah, the invitation is, is from 1993 initially, so it's quite how did vintage. How did everybody react to you? To these pictures? No, the subject to oh, you. Well, in her case, she's a very um, educated, um, you know, urban woman from Delhi who's, you know, who speaks with a British accent. Um, it depends. The ones that would, um, it depends. The tribals, it's a whole other story. I mean, you know, I would have to go find out uh, where the tribes are, and then I would have to um, go to an AGO or to a missionary find out who do they have who works for them or deals with them that actually lives in some of these villages that I'm interested in. And then they have to take me to the village. And then they would, the bows and arrows and whatnot would get taken out of the trees. And I'd get brought in and then I'd have to meet the five elders. And then they would decide whether I was cool enough to allow them. I never was refused because I would come to them and I would say, well, I'm doing a homage of tribals in India, and I cannot not do your tribe. I mean, your tribe, how could I do it without including you? So they were like, so they were keen on that. Wow, that's and great. And so I, then I would have to dance around half naked and eat meat, which I don't really? eat meat. Really? You can't see anything. Because I'd have to kill a chicken or a goat or something. Are you serious? Yeah. You and, had and to. And it's an honor, so you can't refuse it. <laughs> and I also have to drink their horrible mahua, which could make you nauseous. I don't drink. Wow. So, you know, there Did were certain get sick or educational what? hazards that I had to over, wow. overlook. And then I, I would arrange the next day because if I waited till next week, they'd forget about it because in India the word Aj means today or it can mean um, tomorrow but not just not now. Oh, so yeah, yesterday and tomorrow is the same it's word. It's the same right? old thing, it just means not current. Yeah. So I would say, I'm going to come tomorrow, I'm going to bring bags of rice for everybody. I'm going to give everybody a day's wage if they don't go out, and if they don't go anywhere, and we're going to do a photo session, but it has to be done between 8 in the morning and noon, because the light's no good after that. Ah, so, so it's always natural light. It's natural light on a diagonal, you know, you know, you know, you know how horrible high noon is. It's like sure, not, yeah. Not, not pretty. No. So, so is the studio did. outside? Or? So the studio, be out, the studio would be, the, the studio really is these, um, you can notice that the one redeeming thing, whether it's some classy woman in Delhi, or it's a lifeguard from Puri, or it's a tribal man, or the Maharani of, of, of uh, Jodhpur, it's the same wow. backdrop. So How did you it get makes it? that all the same. Was that her, her son, her? the Raj Kumar of um, Jodhpur, was one of my best friends. In New York, going to FIT. You're kidding. And he just told me, I didn't even know. He said, well, when you come to India, you have to come visit. And I was like, well, where is it? He said, oh, it's the palace. <laughs> <laughs> so, actually, he might have even been at one of those dinners that you were at. Raghavendra, yeah. Raptor, do you remember any Indian floating, good-looking, 25-year-old Indian wandering around? Vaguely, that vaguely. Was that was wow, scene. that's amazing. So that was the running theme. That, so my backdrop really was nothing more than a black canvas. 
black canvas backdrop, and then I would put drape a white cotton tent over it, and it would go up against a mud hut, it could go up against two trees, it, wherever it could work. And then I'd hire some locals to, for crowd control. So you think it's very quiet, but there's a whole village. And so you had like all these people well, watching I'm, 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 you. Well, circus come to town. <laughs> hey, he's giving out money, food, hey, you know, fun. It's boring where they live, you know, so, so they loved it. And, um, and, even, and then also, on a serious note, if I felt there were issues, I'd arrange for doctors to come later. Really? And, you know, if I saw babies that looked like they're well nasty. Wow. So it was a good thing that I would come. Yeah. Whereas quite often they were leery because the, the rich Indians and the, would come in and exploit them. Because they're, they're low, they're low caste, they're not even in the caste system. So they're just scum of the earth, you know. So they would, so when they hear, when a stranger comes to their village, they're, they're not so sure it's a good idea, you know. It's not to their benefit quite often. They're trying to steal their land, they're trying to rape their women. Wow, you know, sounds that. like so, American Indians. Well, some people have, one, one um, Indian came to me at a cocktail party once, and actually at her place in Jodhpur, and said, are you knowing, are you knowing this photographer, um, Curtis? Went, no, I said, really. I said, well, yes. He says, he, he, wasn't he not doing similar things? Like he was photographing the, um, the uh, Indians before they Indigenous. went on reservation. Yeah. And I went, well, yes. And he said, Are you, did you know that, uh, that he was born the same year? He died the same year you were born. And, really? And he, and he said, no, I didn't know that. He says, do you believe in reincarnation? <laughs> God, how <laughs> that, weird is that? Bizarre? What yeah. do you think? I think it's a coincidence. But that is wild. But we like coincidences. Yeah, that is really wild. Mm. So tell me about some of these other subjects. That's my friend that came in, Julian. Oh, okay. Wherever he is. He's peeking around the <laughs> yes. Hello, Julian. Hello. Nice, nice to meet you. meet you. I'm glad you're here. Yes. Thank you. Um, your work is very remarkable. Oh, thank you. Hello, then. <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about your work, too, afterwards. I like your work as well. Um, okay, well, he's, uh, he's from Nepal, actually, but I met him in India. And um, I like this picture because his eyes are closed, so therefore when you look into it, the picture, you have to look everywhere because you can't get in. Yeah. That's why I like eyes that are closed in photographs, because they're, the, they're the eyes of the soul. They're the windows of the soul, they say, right? So yeah. all of a sudden, it becomes, uh, you can't get in. And I, I kind of yeah. forces you to look at all the details. He has a lot of emotion. There's a lot of emotion um, coming from it. And, and the is styling the is amazing. Trees, you know, that they grow up and then they grow down and they grow up and then they grow down and they grow up. And really? Yeah. So, oh, right. They're so, beautiful. So they could be the size of a football field. Initially one tree, but it just keeps You're doing kidding. this. So they reroot and reroot and reroot. For hundreds of years or what? Yeah, hundreds of years. And they're, we, we call them uh, snake wow. hotels. They're because beautiful. they just, snakes like to live in them, so we oh, tend to. Oh, that's not so cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is an Indian circus. Oh, that's amazing. That's so that. he's a midget. He's a dwarf, and this is, um, I guess, it's called, his name is Snowball. Oh, they're great And he together. looked a lot happier being photographed by me than he, than Johnson, which was his name. <laughs> he, <wasn't> <laughs> he looks thrilled. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I, I lived in Benares for a while too before I moved I to the. I remember that. When? What year was that? Uh, Vaguely, it must at have the been. early nineties when I, when you, we talked about how I wanted to get a place. Okay. And you have you know you're on the river and you have, you have boats and he was one of the boat wallas. He would be he would row the boats. That's great. I used to row the boats myself because I liked exercise. It was my gym. But if I didn't row a boat, he would row. It. God, he's great. He was my first assistant. Oh, he's so elegant. Isn't he? Wow. He's beautiful. And he made me aware of the horrors of love marriages or not being able to have one. He was madly in love with this girl. And he, after this, I was traveling around India for three months, and he, he was coming along. And he knew that he was going to have to come back and marry not his, the girl he loved, but someone else that his family yeah, had. Arranged. And he was trying to decide whether or not he would run away or go home. What did he do? I never found out. He disappeared. <laughs> but he was very sad. He was always pining away for the woman of his love. 
the love of his life. How right? sad that is, and it still goes on, right? Mm -hmm. And this was the key to my house in Benares, and this was my house boy at the time. He's now grown into a man, he's only 15 there, and he's now married with two kids, and he lives on the property and looks after my whole estate while I'm not there. That's so cool. Yeah, he came to me literally with a bag of his possessions, like a little, he had nothing. His uh, father had died, and he was in Benares looking for work. Really? And I didn't want to have a servant. I, mean, I wasn't like, didn't yeah. know about what that would mean. And then I realized that he would save me money, save me time, and he would have a job. Sure. So and and life he's could been be with easier. me. He's been with me ever since. Hmm. And yeah. so you taught him what he knows about. Are you heated the yeah. Leatherdale School of uh, diplomacy? Like when I met him, it was <laughs> way too loud. Never said thank you. Grabbed. You know, he, he had to be completely. Trained. I said, if you're going to live in my, well, in this case in Benares, it was the same house. Now he has a separate house, a staff house. But for years we lived in. He just lived in a room and off the courtyard. And I couldn't have him screaming and yelling and carrying on and the way like he was still in the village. His name is Kilash. And, uh, and he's the one with the, um, mar is it marigolds? No, I don't face? know. It, it's, um, there's times of years yeah. where they wear flowers in their hair for festivals. Believe it or not, he just came to the jungle house that I was restoring, delivering bricks. This is what a brick delivery boy looks like. In wow, daffodils in the hair and, and everything. Well, not particular. <laughs> and these are bison horn marias. They're, they're noted for when they, when they perform, that they, they wear these bison horns. Wow. Because I know like when they're Indian weddings, they have all those streams of marigolds. Well, that is true. Yeah, and, this is, and, and this is, this is uh, obviously the case here too. But it's the horns that make them more exceptional. When you were telling the gallery owner that two pictures had to be, you liked them sold together, which two pictures uh, were they? They don't have to be, but I'm just saying this one, uh -huh. uh, the two headless torsos, and the one here. This one, yeah. It just ha I like them together, and, and people tend to like them together. But I'm, I don't photograph in pairs, like I don't think. Yeah. Like, oh, this is going to be a pair, or a diptych, or a triptych, or. But you see, these are these, right? These are, they get put on permanently on an anvil. Really? You get a piece of silver, you buy it, and then they bend it onto your, and it's on for life. That's great. I thought so, because I Is thought, it, like and also like the peg, ear, the, the peg earrings, which are actually bamboo. I wanted to show that I wasn't just getting off the bus to take pictures of everything. I wanted that I was like really Part committed to this. But I didn't realize this isn't do too great with security at uh, when you've got to take everything oh, right. off and they go, what about that? I said, I can't take it off. And they're looking like, what do you mean you can't take it off? Oh, yeah. I said, well, it doesn't come off. And how do they... I said, they only, it'll only come off with pliers. And then they think you're weird. But they and, let it go. Well, they usually let you go or else they go through all my luggage. <laughs> <laughs> because they think I'm strange enough to maybe even have stranger things in my luggage. I don't know. Well, but I didn't think about this. Yeah. Well, but it doesn't look like a bomb's concealed. No, 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 but it, <laughs> it's just, you, you know how it is, like, I, well, you must have a hard time going, th like, you yeah. try to dress down to go through customs, yes. and then when you're I standing don't wear in line, a veil or spiders. when you're standing in line, you go, oh, it's not working, because it's no matter never what working. we do, when we're in line, we it's stand It's never up. working. <laughs> and those guys are bored, so if nothing yeah. else, even if they just wanted to look in your luggage, because they got to look in somebody's luggage, yeah. and our luggage looks more interesting than probably that guy who looks like he's going to the gym with an inflatable pillow still around his <laughs> neck. <laughs> you know, you know, people that yeah. coming here, I was Life in line with people, I felt like I was in line to go to the gym. Yeah. Everybody really. was wearing like track pants to go to another country. Yeah, which is, yeah, I know. It, it's always and they even surprising. have their pillows out already for like to sleep. Well, it's the opera, it doesn't look much different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Met? Oh, forget the Met. Yeah, that's true. He's wonderful. He's like Quasimoto, isn't he? Well. He's like a beautiful Quasimoto, but. Yeah. He's not scary looking. He's not deformed. Yeah. And of course, you have a snake charmer. You can't have a snake. You can't have a picture of India without a snake charmer. So when you were under those trees that bent over, yes, the, the bent. Did you trees. ever have a snake confrontation? Well, I have a snake that lives in my backyard. A cobra. He just really? has. They cobras are not dangerous. If you leave really? them alone, they leave you alone. 
there's a con there's this, this snake that kills everybody in India. It's called the crate because they're friendly. Friendly snakes are the worst, worst ones because they're around you and you might step on them and you might. But most snakes, like a cobra or, or, or a viper, the last thing they want to do is be near you. They're far off. Really? And so we just, and they only come out in the monsoon when they get flushed out by the rain. So, you know, I've ne this one, um, I had a wide angle lens though, which makes, you know how wide angle lenses are a lot closer than you think? Yeah. So I was like really taking the picture and all of a sudden I turned around and spit at the lens and I had to be pulled back because I didn't realize how close I was. Yeah, But he scary. said, well, not to worry, I have the venom, I have the venom uh, juice. Oh, really? Great. I said, yeah, how much is that going to cost if I ever needed it? You God, know? you don't want to find out. Yeah. And tell me how a hippo made it to India. God, was, is it the only hippo in well, India? Hippo, well, hippos come from Africa. Yeah. So somehow, in this circus, they've got this drugged, drugged out hippo. Really? They drug it? Well, it would have to be. You know that hippos kill more people? They're dangerous. They right? kill more people They've than crocodiles, them. sharks, anything. Rabbit dogs, anything. They're way up there in terms of one of the most... I heard that because I saw, like, uh, my friend went on a safari and they, there was a swamp full of hippos. Yeah. And I said, oh, that looks so cool. And they go, not at all. <laughs> They're really no. dangerous, right? Mm -hmm. This is a temple beggar. Because is that like this means something? Yes, if it goes this way, it's Shiva. If it goes this way, it's Vishnu. Mm -hmm. It's sandalwood. And it's also very cooling in the hot weather. When they slap this saddle. The first time someone slapped it on me, I got indignant. I went, hey, this feels good. <laughs> really? And it goes this way. You know, they have, they basically, you're either Vishnu, which is like, I think, is he a Vishnu? Yeah, he's, see, he's Vishnu. She so goes up. Yeah, he is great. And then she, and he's also she. These are not extensions, these are real. Wow, he never cut his hair. He walks around with it like that, that's him. Oh, it's great, God. That is amazing. Isn't well, it? I guess he couldn't walk around like this. No, we'd be He'd be cleaning the streets. the streets, yeah. He that says he's got amazing. the longest hair in the world. Like he's he's in a Ripley's, believe it or not. Wow. God. He's so I guess he, he never washes it a bit. He don't. doesn't <laughs> smell. <laughs> These travel boys were actually up in the trees like this when I came into the their village until they were told that I was... Okay. You mean they were ready to stab you or what? Well, just not unsure of people yeah. coming in, you know. But I can get by in Hindi, which helps, because that's their link language. They really? all speak another language. Since when do you speak Hindi? Since I went to Hindu University and learned it from... Really? I, well, it's, I haven't... As soon as I leave India, it almost goes into back burner. Mm-hmm. Like my French, <laughs> and then, um, but when I'm in India, it comes in. Oh, but you grew up in Montreal, right? Yes, but uh, English Montreal. Oh, okay, you're like uh, my friend Jason. It's the same. I didn't doesn't meet a French, French person until I was able to get out of Dodge, until I could get off the, the right side of the tracks and go into the cool part of town. Because you know, really? the French were Catholic and the English were Protestant. The English, the Protestants were upper class, and the French were working class. And you went to different school boards and you lived. So until you could get away from that and get on your own and go venturing out, I didn't even know what French was. And we were taught Parisian French opposed to, I'd say, foy to call it, this tea, you know, like they have a French, Canadian French, which is more like Cockney almost, you know? So when I would speak my proper French, they would think I was being kind of snobby and condescending. So it didn't really, you had to kind of learn ah, street French to really. I never get realized that with Montreal. I just thought everybody spoke French. Oh, now almost everyone does because yeah. there was a separatist movement in the 70s and all the French moved in and all the English companies moved to Toronto. Bankrupt my family. They had to eventually give up my father's veterinary business. He was a vet. He was a, the biggest surgeon and veterinary surgeon in Montreal. He had to, his own hospital and everything. He had. Really? But everybody left overnight to go to, because 360 companies left overnight to when the French separatists, because it became radical. They were, they didn't care how your abilities, as long as you were French, you would do. So it bankrupt the whole, country, the whole city for a while and, and the whole province. So when he lost all, he lost all his clientele because they were all English, and his name was Leatherdale, and they created a, a language 
Gestapo where they forced you, you had to put your sign in French and then in English or you'd be fined. And so they would go to, and French coming in would go to a Dr. Dubois who just got out of college rather than Dr. Leatherdale. I mean, Dr. J.B. Leatherdale is a very not French name. No. It's a real name. You know how everybody yeah. in Montreal, in, Nobody in believes New York it's said, real. Oh, name. It's a really Marcus Leatherdale. And you like leather. And Dr. J.B. Leatherdale, that sounds a lot more legitimate. Yeah, it? that is wild. <laughs> so when did Portugal come into the picture? Portugal came into play when I really was getting depressed coming back from India and having to be in New York. So I thought, why don't I find a place in Europe that's in between New York and so I could still need to go and India and it's got the best climate and it's the cheapest place to live. And I had friends like George and whatnot that lived there. You know, I had people that I knew. And actually George, who I was with, living with at the time in New York, come with his parents. His mother was there and she was having cancer issues. So, um, That's a good reason to It's a good reason to, uh, she's fine by the way, um, but uh, she wanted to be close. So it was, we may not stay there. So it's been 16 years in Portugal or no? 16 uh, years five, together. About five, ten years. About ten years. Wow, it's long. About five years in, in uh, no, about three, four years in Lisbon, and then about five or six years in the country where we are now. And how was it? You just had a show in New York, so yeah. how was it going back there? Had you been there much? I go back or? to New York at least once or twice a year. Oh, you do? But I don't see all the gang, you know, they, all, yeah. they came out of the, you saw the video, I think. Diane Brill, she didn't age at all, no? She, she aged in a good way. Yeah. You know, we all age, hopefully, in good ways, right? I mean, she you can't possibly look. She, you know, she looks like a, a really good version of herself. Because you know, I ran into her a couple years ago in Switzerland. It was funny. She, in, she lives in Zurich. Right? Yeah, with some rich guy. Well, and she has a makeup company. She's married to a German filmmaker. Who's working with her company, right? Yeah, and she's got two kids. And uh, who's graduating from NYU. So, and she spends a lot of time in New York. So how was it like I had going back? A long time. Yeah, it was, it's fine. It, it was because it was a totally different it. show. It was Sorry? hidden identities. It was New York. It was just a mix of. It, it wasn't a hidden identity show per se. It was yeah. just whatever was happening, and that they just chose a lot of images to show that, that mm -hmm. they liked, and that was it. But it was interesting because I'd be wandering around, seeing people I hadn't seen in 20, 30 years, and it's in weird, some cases, no? like yourself, you don't you look the same. Well, not really, but yes, thank no, you. Yes, no, but you do. But there's a lot of people that I had this 80%, and then there was this 20% 20-year thing that you had to kind of add yeah. on to what you're looking at to figure out who they were. Oh, yeah, that's hard. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, I mean, I don't look like I looked like 30 years ago. I have gray hair now, you know, so... But yeah. your face is the same. I guess. Your body is the same. I guess, but there's some people that aren't, you know. You meet oh, people I know. That, they were only felt cute because they're on drugs. You yes. know, back then, in those I days, know. you know, I mean, when they stopped the coke, when they stopped going out every night, when they, <laughs> you know, and, and they just got fat and they stopped dressing and, oh, they, you know, they, yeah. especially guys, they don't have the hair and the makeup and the thing that can keep them kind of, like, I'm sure, you know, like, you know, Diane, it's just what Diane said to me, she came up to me when, at that, at that uh, video, Opening. you saw the video, I think, Yeah, yeah, right? I posted and it. she put her arms around me and she goes, how do you boys do it? You look great. I use makeup and corsets. <laughs> and she says, I don't know what guys do. You know? Yeah, it's you, true. You don't have you that have a few, extra. You have a few things. Like, we have to pretty much be just who we are. It's true. We yeah. don't have the help. We don't it's have the true. smoke and mirror thing that women have. You're right. I like the smoke and mirror. For me, it's a veil and glasses. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, you know, I don't think I've ever seen you. Even back then, I never That's saw my you eyes. Glasses. I know. They've been on my face. Did I like, put a few of those glasses on? Or? You did, but I think I was one of the last hidden identities, and it didn't never got published. That's right, along with you. With, well, you're in good company. There's Madonna. <laughs> there's Debbie Harry. There's Sandra Long. There's a, lot, a whole bunch of people who didn't. But I was just mentioning that to George that I have those pictures, and really? I am going to. I you am should going put to them on Take It Too. I That's will, my I project. You, well, I'll give you. I will give you the. Um, I probably have to print them, but I have the negatives somewhere. That's so great. I will get them to you, and then you can do with them as you want. Very cool. Yeah. I remember because there was a shot like that. Remember? You were sitting in something like this. Yeah. 
I remember I was wearing one of my jackets. Yeah, and your hair was, you, you were doing, you're still starting to do the, like the yeah. Spanish look. And I think you still no were. No veil. And I think because it was hidden identity, especially, you would be wearing glasses. But probably I. Yeah, why would you take them off for hidden identity of all? God, time? never. Because I did, you didn't see my face, right? Or did you? No. No, you're not supposed to. I know, that, yeah, was, the, that was the thing. You want to talk about that a bit, hidden identities for details? Well, yeah, it's got nothing to do with the show, but um, no, but it's the got whole everything premise to do of hidden identities was to, sh was to say, these people are, are interesting enough that you do not need to see their face to know who they are. I mean, you know, that they have a star quality that emanates them from, without having to, like, a, identify them as, as such. And it started off from a Dada night, where I was doing unidentifiable portraits as a concept, and then Stephen said, he said, oh, that's cool, we're starting Detail Magazine. Why don't we, and he came up with the name, why don't we, I don't know, let's say Hidden Identities. So uh, it started that way. It was from 1981. It started early 80s to early 90s, so about 10 years. Wow, that's amazing. Went on every issue, every month. At first it was just any in person in the East Village even. It could be. Yeah. And then it got to, when it started to go like national, and even international, it's being sold in France. Sure, so yeah. Then it had to be like Jodie Foster, or this, you know, it had to be more right. famous people that celebrities. Know. But at one point, it could have been, you know, the cool kid on the bar at the, 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 mud, the, the, the mud club or the, yeah. or the pyramid or something. It didn't have to be Hoover, LA famous. Well, LA. That's yeah. That, LA's destroyed New York, too. It's true. You know what I mean? Yeah. The whole LA red carpet nonsense. It's just, it's I know, everything goes celebrity and it's kind of. I thought back sad. then there was a kiss of death that had anything to do with LA. It's now true. you've got to be part of LA to, to be successful. It's absurd. I guess the supermodels got replaced by actresses and then yeah. everything. And then fashion all of a sudden became red carpet. There's more red carpet now in LA than in New York. Do you think it'll fade? Go back to like, because we don't think of fashion, you just don't think go, of. I don't think things go. Yeah. yeah. So here in India, you have a chance to do just real people that you know, are that characters. That I loved about India was that She's like a bird. Well, um, the, yeah, this is also a circus. Ah, okay. She's um, amazing. What I love about India is that there's drama and fashion and, and, and individual quirkiness going on without, they don't even know it. They just, yeah. like, it's not affected like it was becoming in, in New York. Yeah. They didn't think they were being kooky and weird. They just thought, this is just them. And they couldn't figure out why I'd even be interested in photographing them. That's so great. The champion wrestler. Wow, he's amazing. Yeah. But, you know, their wrestlers are not like American wrestlers. They, they're, they're religious. They, they, mm -hmm. they go to the Hanuman temple, to the monkey temples. They exercise in front of them. And they, you know, and it's, it's, it's a quite a, a zen thing. It's, not, it's more like... A, Kung Fu or something, you know, it's more of an Asian art than it is let's get in the ring and beat people up for money. Did any monkeys ever steal anything from you? No. They're, they're really thieves, aren't they? I had a house on Benares up above <laughs> and every day where I lived there was a huge, huge uh, tree and then the Golden Temple was at the other side of town. But every night, they'd get, every morning they'd get up and they'd have to go across the rooftops to get to the Golden Temples because that's where they got their food source because people were always giving bananas and offerings to the gods and that's what fed the monkeys. So they'd have to crawl over my, my rooftop every single day. And um, <laughs> they would steal anything they could and if they could, or destroy it, either way. So I thought, how am I going to deal with this? Because you can't, you can't, well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't hurt any animal anyways, but you certainly can't do it. They're considered you know, yeah. sacred. So I thought, but I know what I'll do. So I, the next year I came back with a hydraulic uh, water gun. And I got up there like, <laughs> and I was like, poof, poof, poof. And I was knocking, I was like blasting with water. All of, and they were just looking at me like so startled because no one ever thinks anything. And they all went running off, and they didn't come back for quite a while. And I turned around, and all the neighbors were looking at me, and went, I don't know how this is going to go. And they all plotted, and they called me, really? like, uh, the Bandar hero. Rambo, Bandar Rambo, Bandar <laughs> means monkey, and Rambo, you know what Rambo means. Yeah. So for the longest time, I was Bandar Rambo, Bandar Rambo. Well, that's great. And then they came back. 
oh, they have they kept coming. Back. But but they also know that. But they feared me. Like several of them no one ever. They just did what they want. They're brats. They're bullies. Yeah. So I noticed them like a long time ago, when I was in India. I remember there were like a band of monkeys working for gypsies, right? They'd steal and they. would Well, the first time in India, that first time when I was 21, I, um, I was living in a cave because uh, I was just you know, quite often camping out in India. And there was a Nandu, which is the bull, the sacred bull. And I was warned by other sadhus that were living nearby, going, watch out for, I didn't speak any Hindi, but I'm like, uh, 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 uh. what are they talking about? Yeah. And, so, and then they point to my, 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 my luggage, my, my luggage, my food and whatnot. And so in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, this monkey jumped out of nowhere on top of the Nandu, and he had a hair lip. And he said, going like this. And all the monkeys came in to the cave and stole everything I had. And I had a, a camel bag. I had to like literally be knocking them off. And they, they stole my shoes. And back then, feet stop at size eight. And like you can't get a pair of shoes. And I'm like 10. Oh, God. So for a month, almost, and I was traveling all the time, never stayed long enough to ever have any shoes made. So I was barefoot for almost a month because wow, that's I couldn't going get native. any ready-made shoes to fit. Wow, these stories are wild. <laughs> Between Tehran and... That's what's wonderful about India because India is like the other side of the looking glass. Like here, like you know, you know it's around that corner. You've, you've been around that corner before. Yeah. You, you're, you know, you're on automatic pilot. You've been there, done that. In India, you don't know what the fuck's around the corner. You have no idea how you're going to deal with it. So it keeps you young. Yeah. Because you've got to be on your toes because you can't, like, oh, you know, you can't get jaded in India. It's impossible. So that's one of the main uh, things I love about India. It's a love-hate thing, though, too, because the most beautiful things in the world I've ever experienced and the most horrible, horrific things I've ever experienced. Because, like, in Banaras, too, there's, like, burning flesh, right? That's got to be... It takes two days to consume a body. Oh, God. Basically by wood. I can't imagine what that's like. Um, yeah, well, it's in a certain area. You don't go there. <laughs> yeah. You know, I didn't go there. But um, I remember one of the most beautiful moments I ever had was looking for land in, in uh, Bengal. And I was cycling home just before sunset on a long hill where they have rice fields. They have little, little, walk, little walkways that you can kind of go between. So I'm trying to stay on this maze. And then all of a sudden, one white butterfly landed on me, then two, then three. And then all of a sudden, it was like Midsummer Night's Dream. Millions wow. of butterflies. The whole swarm came over the whole, was, and the sun setting. And it, it was like, I, I, I was like literally covered in white butterflies by myself. No, in those days, no camera. Yeah. And actually, I still don't walk around with the camera, so unless someone's taking a picture of me, it goes. On, on yeah. But it was one of the most gorgeous, it was so surreal, but wonderful. It is surreal, it's like um, Garcia Lorca, it's like out of a book. It was unbelievable, and then, and then I remember one of the most horrific moments was I was walking through the streets, and I stopped, and there was a guy on the he was like just grunting and groaning, and he had, he was a torso with a head, and he had a tire wrapped around his middle, and on that tire was a bolt of a little begging cup. And all he did was, he was just going along the ground. Because they cut off their arms. They cut off their arms to yeah, make money. He, no, 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 no. He was born that way. Really? Yeah, no, they do twist, they do deform people to make money. It's true. No, this guy was just, didn't, he was just born, basically. God, God. With no limbs. And he was going, people were wow. stepping over him and kind of ignoring him. And I was just horrified. Wow. So what time of year do you go there, usually? Uh, January, February, March, uh -huh. which is their winter. It's, um, and then it starts to get really hot in uh, May, June, and then you have the monsoons in uh, July, August, September. So the only good time of year to go is really uh, October to March. So yeah, that's six months. Wow. So yeah, who's in the house when you're not there? He stays there? Kailash. Remember the photograph? Oh, right, yes. He has, he and his, and his wife and his two kids, oh. um, are, um, they live there all year round and they look after the place. And you, know, they, and you have a dog, where's that dog? In Portugal. Yeah. There was two dogs, two Dobermans in India, but they passed away since then. We haven't gone anymore. It's 
kind of unusual to have dogs in India, right? Oh no, it's Pets. not usual. It's usually it's unusual to have Dobermans. <laughs> yeah. But not those. They have these kind of song tall hounds that just whine and complain and yap and. Sort of like. Well, those are no. Th this dog is a city dog that you would see only like in apartments. The country dogs were. Um, they kind of looked like jackals. But so I had to import. I had to import the Dobermans from Calcutta from a breeder. Because we have five, we have five acres, and, they run, and there's five a six, acres. twelve foot wall all around the gatehouse, and two Dobermans inside, so there's no, never any uh, chance of anything happening. Well, that's great. And Portugal, where is it? He's beautiful. He's gorgeous. He's a borzoi. He's a white borzoi. And um, he, ha he lords over seven acres in the Quinta, and uh, you know, as long as you're not a cat or a male dog, he loves you. That's great. So should I leave you to your guests? Yes. Okay. That should be more than enough, no? Yeah.